It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Mines. Welcome. My name is Abu Kawabuchi, and thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, we have had a very eventful week across the nation. So many issues to tackle, but we're going to be talking today at the top of the show about exploring the ease of doing business in Nigeria, especially with a lot of the matters arising in the last week. Um, if you've been following the news, you've heard a lot of what's happened with the Lagos Calabar Coastal Road. It's been the most talked about infrastructure project in many, many months, probably years uh, in our history. And um, it's come with its own fair share of controversy. And um, we're going to be trying to understand what that means for the future of Nigeria on so many aspects, but most importantly, with regards to investment and the ease of doing business. Um, I'm joined here by the CEO of Finance with Mukhtar, Mr. Mukhtar Mohammed. Thanks a lot for joining us. So, I mean, I was trying to get through to look at um, Nigeria's ranking in the ease of doing business, and we're somewhere around the 131st position out of 190. Um, a lot of presidents come in and, you know, give these assurances that that's going to be the goal, to get us up in that ranking by creating policies that would help that. We've seen sort of attempts <laughs> to, you know, relax what happens at CAC with registration of companies, but it goes beyond that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mood of the government, the language of the government, and how you act yeah. with those who are already here mm -hmm. says a lot, you know, about how those who are not here yet will come in. Um, what are your thoughts so far? It's been about a year now since the present administration has been in, in office. What, what sense do you get from the president's Tinubu administration? <laughs> I think about the area of ease of doing business, I don't think he has touched on that yet. Um, I don't think so, because they, they came in, they made a lot of barrage of problems, especially exchange rate, economics, so much so, because virtually there was no economy. I think the only um, 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 government official after, during the Buhari administration that looked at the area of the ease of doing business was the former Vice President, Yemi Shivajo. Remember when he was acting president, he went to the airport, he said, uh, no more have you, because when you go to the airport, you have NDLE, you have, uh, you have custom, you have DSS. police, you have uh, paramilitary. And he went there and said, no, you can't be doing this. I move from custom to NDLE, from NDLE to this with my bags. So he tried to come up with the policy. I think that worked out when we moved from over, we're about 160 to where we, where we are up to now. I think since this administration have come into power, they've not been able to stamp their feet on that, on the ease of doing business, because um, I think it's only the Minister of Inter Interior that has been trying to make sure that we begin to have this um, um, synergy in the airport, whereby he said they will soon have the digital clearance of your immigration passport, and that and that, uh, you, you need to go back and remember the CNN um, um, reporter that said anytime he comes into this country, he will still have to pay for biometrics. Uh, so those are part of the things that the government really need to look at. Knowing especially that uh, within Africa, we need to begin to set a peace within ourselves because um, in Europe, I, I don't need, uh, I just need my passport to go to any place in Europe, if, I, if, I'm, a, if I'm a citizen of the European nation. How can you be a citizen of the EU and you want to go to as, a little place as Seychelles and they are telling you that you have to pay for your visa and that and that? I don't think, so that for me, that's a major challenge because Africans have not looked at it as a means of growing their economy, the ease of doing business, because it has created a lot of room for corruption, a lot of room for personal enrichment. So a, a lot needs to be done there, but kudos to the Ministry of Interior with what they're doing, especially in the airport, trying to make sure that we have that um, ease of coming in and going out, but there's still a lot to be done. And also you can give it to the immigration in, in, uh, officers also in the Murtala Mohammed, but they've been very cold here in the way they relate with people. But um, some have been bad eggs because we saw some videos. But again, when you look at it by and large, where we are coming from, we, we, we should say we are a little bit there from 160, 130. But we've been too static in 130, so we need to yeah. move on. I mean, people will say there's a lot of low-hanging fruits for a lot of these things uh, that are the issues. You've mentioned a couple of them. I mean, at the airport now, you still have a, a couple of those officials who stop you at every point when you're coming in. And people have always wondered why that synergy does not happen. But that's just even one. I mean, I think uh, the Minister of Aviation did have an interview during the week talking about trying to get a private partner who was going to sort of start running the airport since government yeah, creates all of these bottlenecks. But the government, on the other hand, also says infrastructure is the biggest way to attract 
uh, FDI. They tell you you have to build these things for them to see that it's easy to come in. You know, the infrastructure is there, so it's easier. Is that a valid point? Because that's one of the biggest selling points the Minister of Works has put forward with this uh, particular project. You see, President Buhari pride himself to be the infrastructural president. And after I left, we've seen a lot of nothing seems to have moved our economy, our economy for eight years under Kumoso. We've seen how much we borrowed and borrowed and borrowed to build infrastructures that now are not even generating the necessary revenue. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure, you see the problem with I, I think with Nigeria is that when we think of infrastructure, we just think of that large gigantic road network, that big building, that um, state of the art building. Nobody looked at the human infrastructure. Because sometimes you build the infrastructure, who are you going to manage the infrastructure? So the challenge we've had is not because we cannot build infrastructure. Who is going to manage this infrastructure? So after some time, when you don't have managers of this infrastructure, they were trained to manage this infrastructure, or they have the capability to, this infrastructure decay. All you need to look at, you look at the National Stadium in Lagos, you look at the Abu, Abu Mashud Abiola Stadium in Abuja also, you see where capacity has not come to play. Now, if you go to develop war, when the, when the Minister of Aviation is saying, you, you know what, uh, we, need to, we need to handle it, but it's not rocket science for me. So what are your ministry staff doing? Why didn't you use that as an avenue to create more jobs? Why do you mean that as an avenue also to boost their capability? When you go to foreign countries, I, I, like you said, I tip, pick up my luggage. Nobody check my luggage again after it's dropped. It's always a digital. So how much are we trying to develop this kind of platform? But here you are traveling, you are coming, you are, you are holding your tag. You are holding your tag and you come in from the plane and they are, you come with two, three bags. They are counting the bag and looking at the tax. Those are infrastructures. So even if you bring in the private people, I mark you, most of the people that are even looking at those your tax are even private that were employed by them. So how from when you look at the private people, are you bringing them to do anything different? No. Rather, you are just trying to bring them to, maybe, maybe to empower a friend that helped you to be there because his company is into that. No. We must think of, if you want to build infrastructure, when you talk about infrastructure, you talk about digital infrastructure. These days, infrastructure is not about, infrastructure is about digital to make things ease of doing business. So if you have the digital infrastructure, you don't need four, five, six, seven people standing on the way stopping me. Yeah. It's all on the system. So why is it that it's easier for you to travel to other countries and you take your, your, your baggage and you, you, you do digital scanning of your baggage and you pass through? And nobody's coming to ask you anything. Now you go through. Why is it difficult? It's no record science. Okay. It's just because we don't have, we don't have the political will to want to do the right thing. We're joined now virtually by Gospel Obele, who's an economist, and I wanted to get to him very quickly. Gospel, if you can hear me, <clears throat> how are you doing? Can you hear me? Hi, Ibuka. Good afternoon. I can hear you clearly. Thanks for joining us. So I, just, I wanted to zero in on Lagos State in particular, because you can't talk about Nigeria's economy without talking about Lagos. It's a huge uh, part of our GDP uh, as the commercial nerve center of the country, and it's sort of embroiled in what's going on now. I was going through uh, a business day publication. They had a list of the top 10 states in Nigeria for ease of doing business. It was Gombe, Jigawa, Sokoto, Kebi, Katsina, Bauchi, Anambra, Kaduna, Yubi, and Plateau. Lagos was not anywhere there. Now, we did have in the past the controversy with Gokada, who had come in and put in this huge investment um, that ended up uh, with a ban on Okadas, and the, the investment ended up uh, folding. And now we have the landmark situation. Um, I mean, there's, you can say on the one hand that it's not a Lagos State problem because the federal government says it's their right of way, but this property was given to them by the Lagos State government. And people say that these things are signals to people who would like to come into the country to invest when they see what other businesses are going through or have gone through. What's the motivation to come in? Well, um, first of all, I mean, Lagos is one of the, if not to say to say, the commercial capital in Nigeria right now. And um, as much as things have evolved significantly in Lagos, there's still a very strong red ocean market and also host of lots of opportunities, you know, if, if, if unlocked correctly by the means of regulations um, and, and proper investments in legal, Lagos economy. Now, what has happened recently with the landmark story has been a bit limiting in terms of how those narr that narrative has been sold. And to a large extent, we've also not seen the, the, the necessary regulatory um, institutions within the state, you know, come out to say anything. All right, these things are very, very key in terms of protecting investors' interest. Investors want to be able to understand the state side of the story, to be able to balance out on what necessary, what happened, you know, in context and how that is also being evolved, how that, how that development is, is, is constantly being evolved. Um, 
it's safe to say that all right the, the reason why the the the, the the reason why doing business in Lagos is pretty difficult is because of the cost side, all right, of doing business in Lagos in itself. And it take, it take for instance as well, you look at the consumer side who are also trapped in daily increased cost of living because it's Lagos primarily. Now, there's an increased cost of living um, nationally in Nigeria and even globally, but some states ha are much more exposed by, by virtue of the cost dynamics of how that state operates. All right. So you realize that states like Ibadan or your state are slower in terms of pace of 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 uh, taking on those shocks than Lagos. All right. And and you've seen that all of those things are rubbing off on doing business. But what I what I'm, I meant to say here is that the Lagos state government has to come forward to project the state for uh, as a you know as a state of opportunity. All right. For doing business. And what I want to say for five is regulatory benefits. All right. That are being introduced to protect investors. Protect local businesses and all of that, and also really jump on this business narrative because with the old transportation, sorry, infrastructure link up between Lagos and your state, it's now a, a thing of how do you attract people away from quote unquote seemingly um, very busy red ocean markets. All right, I lack the probably necessary regulations to um, seemingly more slower paced, um, um, increasing purchasing power income market. All right, and I've seen that firsthand. You right, you have a spa business who was formerly into the show market relocates to your state, and they, and and they're doing way better than they're doing right now when they were in Lagos State. You have a, a small smoked fish startup. All right, who couldn't even access to put their own products on the shelf in Shoprite, and they have been able to do that in the same Shoprite in Ring Road, Ibadan. All right, so the dynamics of these markets are changing all right so one of the things that I, I would probably want to encourage the state governments to do is to project the light of the states better and then states are neighboring to project the opportunities of doing business in those other states better and then startups who have also benefited from this engagement should be plugged into the mainstream of that storytelling but it's safe to say as well that Nigeria in itself have not been able to come up with a very context-driven metric for, for, for measuring business performance in, in, you know, in the sense. The only institution that have, that have um, succeeded and successfully attempted to do so is Faith Foundation. All right, it's a Faith Foundation State of Entrepreneurship Report where they've been able to cluster all states in terms of ease of doing business, business performance, perception to opportunities, innovation, technology adoption, and the likes. And I think that is a slightly more close to accurate, especially when it comes to reflection of how policies in the past one year has impacted on the ease of doing business in Nigeria. So I think we need to do more in supporting local institutions who are voicing out from an evidence-based perspective as well as you know, state regulatory bodies and neighborhood state has to also have to do better in terms of um, explaining and helping us understand the context for doing business and how opportunities are evolving as well. So um, my guest here, Muqsa Mohamed, had talked earlier about you know, some of these low-hanging fruits that are available to government. And the one thing he said, which we tend to hear a lot, is this lack of political will as a whole to do anything. You know, you've mentioned there data, for example, is almost impossible to find anywhere in Nigeria with regards to things like this. You know, why are we not there yet? I mean, we have a government who's, who promised to assemble a stellar team. Uh, we have a CBN governor who's doing things, I mean, on the fiscal side of things, um, on the monetary side of things. We have a government who's with Minister of Finance. I mean, we don't hear from the CBN government, but we at a point now where we understand that policy is probably as important, if not more important, than this infrastructure talk sometimes. Why is it so hard to get that political will to do this? Thing? First and foremost, Ebuka, to be honest with you, one of the things that we've missed on a landslide, regardless of the administration in power, is that we've grossly underestimated the effort it will take to ensure Nigeria is a working business environment. Nigeria has a working business environment, meaning that all right, it's easy to start a business, to grow, to thrive, and all of that. And that's because the market dynamics of how the Nigerian economy works, all right, in many cases, is not being factored into the manifestos, into the elections, into the you know, governing dynamics, even into the selection of those who manage public offices, and into how policies are being drawn, all right, even when uh, an administration kicks off, in a sense. All right, take, take for instance now the single impact of inflation on the ease of doing business. All right, inflation in itself has crippled the supply chain, has crippled the cost of doing business. Interest rates have impacted on the cost or the cost of capital.
capital or right, the cost of accessing uh, the cost of borrowing money and all of that to run your business production and all that all right um, uh, um the average nigerian is struggling all right trying to meet the basic necessity now as markets are evolving you also have a state where some certain industries have evolved on their own all right in, um, in, in spite of government you also have a case where many industries for example the cosmetic beauty care industry are grossly either not regulated or under regulated all right so you have a case of um, um a poor regulation you have a case of um, market behavior constantly changing as a result of speculation around tripping and all that you also have a case of many other market market dynamics happening at the same time now if you do not factor these things within the context of the policies you're trying all to right. make all right you would lose track of, of what really you need to do all right to en en enable the environment uh, kick up when it comes to ease of doing business so outside just the political will there's a gross underestimation of the efforts required to ensure that policies are a reflection of how markets are evolving and they fit within the context of you know the flexibility of how markets are evolving as well all right i'll come back to you now let me let me uh, throw this to my guest here in the studio because he mentioned something there and i wanted to get your thoughts on that how much can uh, the state's governments uh, do in spite of the federal government? I mean, he touched there about what a state like Oyo State, for example, can do with regards to what's happening with Lagos. Do the state governments have enough of an incentive to fix their regions while the federal is not doing enough on the policy side? Do you, is that a realistic way to look it's at it? It's a realistic way to go. Well, what we've seen is that we see governments that... Um, practice um, feeding board, what they call it, they call it, they say this feeding board of federalism, whereby every every month they're thinking of how much will come from Abuja. Nobody's looking at, can I develop my state to make my state what it is so that it can attract investors. It can, if you look at the state that you mentioned of ease of doing businesses, how much have those states attracted, attracted to the Nigerian economy? You look at, when you look at in terms of foreign direct investment or foreign portfolio investment that have come into this country, you realize that 95% of those comes through Lagos. And it's, not, it's based on the infrastructure, the federal infrastructure that is there in Lagos, and also with what the state government have been able to do. And if you want to talk about the state government, sometimes you see some rights from things that they've done that have, end up killing businesses, multiple taxation, you talk about the go card that thing, you talk about even the current dispatch rider. Sometimes when you're driving, you see the way they, this, this, these young guys are being harassed from one point to one local government, even within Lagos State. You talk about double taxation. So what we've seen, we've not seen a state that have come together and look at the informal sector and say, like, this sector is me. It's my state um, 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 way of growing, growing our own state-owned economy. No state has been able to come up with a state-owned economic policy whereby it's been driven by the state. Well, then what you get from the federal is just an addition. Almost all the states in Nigeria depend, even if you look at the South-South state, they, they depend on the 13% derivation, they depend on the special needs being their oil producing states. I mean, they don't really come up with innovations to drive businesses to grow in their own sector. Except from Kirby state, they have tried to do the Kirby rise, where you see the government putting in a lot of policy there, and this rise are only patronized in places like Lagos state. How do you think if Lagos decide to be, become the aquatic splendor or the, the, the fishery headquarters, in, in, in Nigeria, because over 80% of the landmass in Lagos is water. So have we been able to come up with innovation on how to grow this, the, based on the resources that we have? The state will tell you that, oh, federal government, you don't own resources in the state. But i give you an example. Federal government said, okay, every state now, you can even generate power. They were making noise before now. Oh, wait, you don't give us the license. And all of a sudden, President Tinubu, the first thing he signed into law was the ability for every state to be able to, how many states have been able to develop in one kilowatt into, everybody seems to go back because they don't seem, what we see is that we don't have uh, uh, businessmen running the state affair. We have people that have all their lives have been in the public sector. So they don't even know how the private sector operates. So every state can decide. Let, let me give an example like your State. If your State decides that we used to be the headquarters of cocoa in this country. As a government, we are going to support cocoa uh, farmers. In the end, that when cocoa farmers, Mark, when these farmers earn this money, they are going to bring it back to your state. You are going to earn taxes from those, from those exports. You are going to attract foreign investment into your state. Maybe by virtue of that, one, one chocolate company will want to come. Let's like establish a base here in your state because it's close to the road. So states don't think like that because sometimes the, politic, the politician in this part of the world only think about the short term.
You say, oh, I have only four years. Oh, I have only eight years. I, there's little that I can do in that. It's nobody thinking about an industry that you, you grow that will take you about 12 years to build up, to get to where you want to get to. Because it's that after that, the incoming administration will take the glory. That's why you see sometimes administration is going out of power. He started a project that is not yet fully impersonal. He said, I want to commission it because he wants it to be his project. When he's talking about, uh, when you talk about, he was saying political will, even with that. Look, it's the politicians that are in power that will give you the necessary impetus to say, okay, I want to establish a structure that is going to run with or without me. When he was talking about businesses, it's not rocket science, we don't need, you need the politi political will to set up something that will run without you. Nigerian challenges as it stands are structural. It's okay. not about, um, but, but, but the average Nigerian politician is talking, and when you see another Nigerian politician talking about, um, uh, talking about um, 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 right. what, their popular language, um, their restructuring, restructuring. <laughs> what they are talking right. about is political restructuring. Nobody's looking at economic restructuring. Right. And it's an economic restructuring that will build prosperity. I tell people, what's the essence of governance? Government is just here for two reasons. Provide security and create prosperity for your people. Thank you very much, sir. Um, this is a very extensive conversation, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, thank you very much, Muktam Ahmed. Thank you very much, Gospel Obele, for joining us virtually. Um, we'll look at the remaining parts of the year, and hopefully things start to shape up. Thank you.